Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Fago Maradian here at the Navy League's annual Sea Air Space Conference and Trade Show in National Harbor, uh, Maryland, just outside Washington, D.C. And it is a true honor to be interviewing our next guest, somebody who, uh, with whom I've had an, aff uh, an uh, affiliation since 1978, where we went to the same high school, Hunter College High School in New York City, uh, Rear Admiral Christian Boris Becker, who is the commander of Spay War. Admiral Becker, thanks very much for your time. Bob, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, it's, it's, it's fantastic to, to see you and congratulations. Uh, and I wanted to start off with, uh, with space. Uh, obviously, uh, your command is the executive agent uh, for uh, UHF, uh, then the cleverly named follow-on UHF, and then uh, MUOS. So at least, you know, that's, that's kind of, you know, walk, walk, through us, walk us through the, the space architecture that, that you guys are working on to create and how important it is for the entire DOD force. Well, first of all, uh, SpayWar is uh, part of the overall DOD's effort for space, um, building on a great legacy of our Navy in space, a legacy that goes back to uh, decades ago uh, when we first launched Vanguard from the National Research Laboratory, and the Navy's been in space ever since then, never looking back. Um, today, we're the, as you said, the Navy's executive agent for UHF, narrowband UHF comms for the Joint Warfighter, uh, and MUOS is operational uh, with our legacy payload, and we'll be operational with the WCDMA payload, that's the 3G cell phone, once we complete our testing. Um, what comes next? Uh, well, we look to the future to decide what the best way to meet narrowband UHF comms requirements for the Joint Warfighter will be. Uh, and that, that will be a broad uh, review of all capabilities from uh, lease services to building satellites. It will be an exciting time for Navy space and the joint space that we provide. What, what um, kind of um, architectures and ideas are you looking at right now as you begin to like sketch out what that constellation should look like? What are some of the attributes you guys would like to, to, to have in that new system? Well, at this point, it'd be premature to talk about an architecture for narrowband UHF comms, but I think it's very appropriate to talk about all the lines of effort that we have uh, looking at how we can provide space-based capabilities to meet naval requirements, and not just in UHF comms but all the requirements for uh, precision navigation and timing, for uh, meteorology, for uh, ISR. How can we meet the Navy's needs? And we have some exciting lines of effort underway, uh, looking at nanosats and small sats, as well as applying commercial capabilities from the proliferation of space-based services. How can we take those services and apply them to naval needs in much the same way we're taking commercial services for IT and apply those to naval requirements? Um, what I think is really, really cool, you mentioned nanosats. Uh, I've long been a nanosat fan, and it's unbelievable when you go over there to the MUOS display, and right next to it is an actual nanosat that's not much larger than the model of the, of the MUOS. What are some of the most exciting nanosat projects you guys have ongoing that you can talk about? Well, the most exciting part of the project are the people. Um, and working on nanosets is a great way to get young engineers engaged in space, engaged in our system center, and reaching out to the rest of the naval and the joint space community. We have uh, contacts in the Army with the uh, Space and Missile Defense Center, or Army Strategic Command. We work with the Space and Missile Center in LA. It's an exciting time to bring engineers together to work on complex problems in a rapid fashion to iterate capabilities at low cost and high speed. Now, they're not exquisite, but it's a great way to start. <laughs> I saw you slip that uh, Secretary Gates term in there. But, you know, what, you know, generally the, the drive toward exquisiteness has been driven by this sort of sense of, look, this is a giant system, it's going to go into orbit, we can't really touch it for a long time. You know, what are some of the different ways of thinking about a problem where, you know, because until a couple of years ago, there were some folks who, who just were not in the DOD space particularly interested in nanosat. How, how do you have to change the way that you think about space and how you're delivering it that then unlocks that ability to go unexquisite? Uh, General Hayden has spoken very openly, both as, uh, as uh, Air Force Space Command and Strategic Command, about the fact that space is contested. Uh, also uh, about the need for resiliency in our capabilities because we are so dependent on space throughout our missions and mission areas across the services. But that doesn't mean we don't need capabilities that range from uh, the resiliency of small sats where you can iterate on capabilities, they have short life cycles, etc., to the exquisite where we need particular missions met by particularly stressing capabilities. Uh, the difference today is to look at an architecture and having a vision for how we, we the department, provide space-based capabilities for the joint warfighter and the intelligence community. We can't forget the partnership, the bond between those two organizations that will make us successful and keep us successful and keep us competitive in that contested space domain. 
One of your other key uh, mission areas is, is cybersecurity. And obviously all eyes are on it, whether you're talking about you know, email hacks from a national level of talking about what the potential uh, ramifications and implications for a cyber campaign are. Uh, there are a variety of other threats, China and some of, some of its efforts uh, in terms of uh, our networks, to the Iranians, to North Korea, to, to a number. So the challenges are manifest. As you work this problem, you also face sort of increasing technology spirals that are moving ever more quickly in an acquisition system, even though you're in that business, that sometimes does not move with the agility that we would like it to move. And to stay on, you know, and, and you're, you're dealing with a giant enterprise, so by the time you start upgrading stuff, other stuff's falling off. What are the challenges and the keys to providing that security, but also operating with agility to try to stay, at least don't get totally outpaced by the speed of technology? The first thing is the absolute recognition that information is a war fighting domain. And I don't think there's any naval leader today that would argue that point. That information is a war fighting domain, the same as uh, uh, undersea, surface, and air, and space. Cyberspace, information, we have to be able to fight and win in that domain. That changes the, how people look at that domain, and that's fundamental. The former Fleet, uh, Fleet Forces Commander, Emil Gordney, once referred to the fact that he had a couple of hundred thousand cyber warriors. In other words, anybody who logged into the network was on the cyber battlefield. That's again a mindset about how to treat that domain and the same way we would treat protecting our ships at sea or, or uh, our aircraft on a flight line. The technology part gets easier when you start to think of it in those terms because now you have a, a compelling reason to try to look for how to keep away from or keep that obsolescence at bay finding a way to recapitalize both your infrastructure and then your services and then ultimately your software. And that will drive change in how we deliver the architecture. We've delivered a capability for our networks ashore and for expeditionary networks and at sea based on a mindset previously that it was a business system, it was an administrative system. Now that we recognize it's a warfighting system, we have to find the technological way to move more rapidly, to move at the pace of the shelf the state of the shelf for commercial technology, and then faster than that to turn a tighter radius than it would be adversaries. That means disaggregating software from the underlying platform and infrastructure. Once we disaggregate those things, it'd be a lot easier to iterate, iterate successfully on capabilities and bring capabilities to the fleet faster and in a more secure manner. Part of our role at Spaywar is to develop the information technology and technical authority standards by which all systems commands can deliver software applications, not just inside the house of Spay War. We've got 26 out of 39 complete and we'll finish up by the rest of the year. And that'll help keep our Navy moving in the same direction with regard to cybersecurity standards. You're also an acquisition professional. What are some of the, the keys and rules of thumb that you're using and you're directing your force to use to reduce those cycles, to be more flexible? You know, what are some of the things, what, what's, what, what are the, the standing orders you're giving them about how you want them to be behaving to be able to drive this capability to the force at greater speed, but also with greater affordability? Integrating the enterprise was a phrase I used in a previous position as one of my guiding principles. And that's what we're all about, integrating into the enterprise so that when we look at the program you're delivering, you have to assess how it fits in the bigger picture of the rest of those capabilities. Earlier on a panel today, you may have heard Admiral Grossglogs talking about that, that very same thing, the interoperability built in from the ground up. Certainly that applies to the cyber domain in our information warfare space. That's a fundamental principle every day. And frankly, the second principle, or really the first principle, is that it starts and ends with the fleet. How are we supporting the fleet with today's capability and sustaining that capability, as well as delivering the future capabilities that we need in the information warfare domain tomorrow? Those standards, they're going to help us move faster. The people that are delivering those standards, that are delivering those capabilities, they're the information warriors, the acquisition warfighters that will give the fleet the capabilities they need to fight and win. It's not often you look at a gray Navy cabinet and consider it something sexy, but the Keynes program, uh, which has a very, very simple acronym that I'll let you explain, <laughs> um, is, is one of those things. Why is the Keynes uh, program so important? And what are the challenges of retrofitting this on every single ship in the fleet? The Consolidated to Float Network Enterprise Services Program, or Keynes, is all about recapitalizing a network that grew up to support our, our ships at sea into a, a, a a network that compresses five other networks onto one. That helps us with life cycle, that helps us with security, that helps us with the singling up on training. That's key. 
again though, going back to the point that the network is a war fighting platform, that'll help us pre pre uh, present the right attention to that system. Uh, not to get to too geeky about it, but delivering uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as, as a service, and ultimately software as a service will only be possible by moving and continuing the development of the Keynes program. We can't get it out there fast enough. Uh, what's the ramp plan for it? How long is it going to take to retrofit the entire force? Ultimately, there may be some ships out there uh, that never receive gains. Uh, but that we continue to patch with capabilities as they need them to make sure they maintain their cybersecurity. Uh, Keynes will, as a program, takes us out into the early 20s. But fundamentally, we will have an afloat network. That afloat network will always be with us, and we will be continuing to evolve that network to meet the capabilities that the fleet needs to provide the defense and depth that we need to pre prevent the adversaries from uh, attacking our network successfully and delivering the warfighting capability that the fleet needs. The program, is, as written, extends into the early 20s. But we'll always have a network, and it'll continue to, to evolve. As you look at the Navy's networks, how secure are they from your standpoint? Are they as secure as they need to be, given that, you know, you know it's already been demonstrated, whether it's for automobiles or cell phones, or you know, even the most secure things can be cracked uh, with potentially dangerous consequences. And if you look at modern warship, the integrated propulsion, integrated weapon systems, you know, become a challenge. How secure are the platforms as far as you're concerned? Vago, we make them as secure as we possibly can. Uh, but no organization can promise 100% security, 100% invulnerability at any time. And we've seen that play out in various scenarios over the last few years. The question is, how do we gain further security, maintain that security, and provide the defense and depth that we need in order to make sure we can maintain operations. And if there is an incident, how do we respond to that incident? How do we recover from that incident? And how do we move on from that incident? Uh, th those are sorts of the approaches that you'll look and see in the, uh, the NIST standards for cybersecurity. Being able to detect, being able to respond, react, and then monitoring that network to understand what's happening, what's going on. So if you do have an intruder that climbs over the fence, you know where they are right away and you're able to respond. Admiral Becker, thanks very, very much. Great seeing you. Congratulations and fair winds and following seas. Thanks, Vago. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much.